socialist left-wing groups, uh, the major ones being Socialist Alliance, the Communist Party of Australia, as well as other smaller forums and um, unaligned individuals and some ex-Greens. Um, we strive to unite the left wing in Adelaide to actually not be sectarian and actually try and do uh, better, more united political work to achieve our goals. The initial design of the Euro was flawed. It's based on bad theory. Uh, it's a unique system unlike any other system in the world. And if you were to design a system that was intended to fail, this is the one that you would have come up with. So it's a bit peculiar. Um, that's the first problem. There's a fundamental design flaw that makes the euro quite unlike any other monetary system. And that's why you see these very peculiar, very large spikes in interest rates on so-called sovereign debt. It's not sovereign debt. The second problem is there was a misdiagnosis of the problem to begin with. Greece is not the general case in the Euro, it's a special case. The problem is more to do with private debt and capital flows from surplus economies like the German, the Netherlands and Finland into the southern countries like Spain, Greece, Italy. They didn't understand this particular problem. They treated it as a Greek problem which was fudging the national accounts, using, of course, our favorite friend Goldman Sachs to fiddle the national accounts, which was a serious issue that should have been dealt with and has, nothing has happened about that. And then the third cause that's interacting, given this wrong diagnosis, the policy that they proposed austerity and so on is completely wrong. Any old macroeconomist would have told you if you do this you're going to destroy these economies, you're going to impair the ability of the governments to balance their books anyway, so you're not going to achieve your objective. This is now being generally recognized I think by everyone in Europe but having boxed themselves into a corner they're not sure how to get out of it. There is an attempt currently to form a political union or something that resembles a political union in the middle of this crisis. And that's the only solution that they can come up with because without the political union you cannot have a monetary union. It won't survive. It will sooner or later bust apart. At the moment you've still got everyone committed, Germans, German government, uh, the European Central Bank, the economic the European Commission, committed to saving the euro subject to these austerity conditions being opposed, uh, imposed. So for example, Mario Draghi, who's the governor of the European Central Bank, comes out and says he'll do whatever it takes to save the euro. And then when you read what he says, oh, but he will only move if Spain in particular and other countries ask officially for bailout funds from the European Stability Mechanism or what it was called, the European Financial Stability Fund, what it is now. So he wants more austerity imposed on Spain uh, before he will try and bring down their long-term interest rates in the, in the bond markets. So it seems to me that they still have not acknowledge the fundamental flaw in the Euro, which is they have to have a political union and if Germany cannot agree to a fiscal and transfer union as say exists in Canada, the United States and Australia, where we have our own common currency, there's no way that they can continue to run the Euro on current uh, arrangements. The only thing that stopped the complete collapse has been the European Central Bank that has underpinned or kept on life support the banks in the southern zone countries. Without that, the whole thing would have fallen over already. Unfortunately, governments in these southern zones are insolvent, or they can become insolvent as the economic situation worsens. And that's the fundamental problem that they have to solve. You cannot allow in a modern monetary system 
a situation to arise where a government can be insolvent. Once you allow that, you're hostage to the bond markets, your interest rates are going to go through the roof, you're going to create what some economists have identified as a self-fulfilling prophecy. Everyone will start to speculate against you. It's not George Soros that you have to worry about, it's everybody who becomes a speculator when you create a situation like this. They'll move their money out of the southern zone, countries into Germany and the north, and bring about the very situation that everyone's worried about. Uh, one factor that undermined the effectiveness of the Growth and Stability Pact was that uh, France and Germany, two champions of it, uh, after being in recession or stagnation for a number of years, knowingly breached some fundamental rules of the pact in order to uh, enhance their own growth. Uh, the 2008 global financial crisis pulled the rug out from underneath Greece's feet and set off a chain, chain of events that leads uh, to today where Greece can barely afford to pay the interest on their loans, which has increased hugely since they were taken out. Moves are being made to privatize a lot of the services while slashing public jobs and wages. Only in the last few days have more details come out about the next round of bailouts. They include a fourth reduction of public sector wages, which have already been reduced by over 40% compared to 2009 levels. In the last two years, we've seen things like really massive general strikes and really big ones, really powerful ones. The thing is they didn't really sway what was actually going on in the country. They didn't really um, have the kind of power people expected them to. The capital wasn't as willing to give up on this austerity thing, that it was such overarching pressure from outside that didn't really matter what was going on in Greek production as to um, its effect on government decisions to increase austerity. And so, of course, you saw like huge escalations in conflict and massive explosive demonstrations and stuff like that. There's been a notable strike by steel workers who many months ago went on, went on strike and were, were you know, demanding saving their jobs and things like that. And um, they eventually lost because the, um, the union struck a deal with the employer. But that became a beacon of, of resistance in Greece and people were drawn to it as like these people are standing up to resist in in this way of having a small strike in a large central industry. There's also been a hospital occupation, which I think was quite interesting and probably one of the more interesting things that's, ha that's happened in Greece in the last few years, which the staff at this hospital went, well, we want to go on strike because, you know, we're getting screwed over. A lot of public servants are going unpaid in Greece at the moment. So they went, but yeah, a hospital can't go on strike. You can't have a hospital go on strike. People will die. So they just occupied the hospital and they started running it themselves. And that again became this beacon for, for the working class to, to come to and say, look, here's, here's something we can do. We can actually take over these places. We can have everyone from the cleaners to the nurses to the doctors to the, you know, the administrators coming together in assemblies to meet and run this place. We don't need you know, the, the system as it is. We can work out ways to do this on our own. Um, which lends a lot of confidence to, to people to be able to resist. Because especially in, in crucial industries like a hospital where typically you can't strike. You know, doctors or nurses or ambulance drivers or whatever, they can't strike because the hospital will fall to shit and then people will die. So, so um, you know, that, that, that proves not only uh, the one you can do it, but when you're doing it, you're sowing the seeds of an entirely new way of, of running society in the meantime, which is, I think, quite incredible. And the hospital occupation has since been crushed, but I'm not, under, I'm not sure under what circumstances um, that's occurred. Um, there's also been the rise of neighborhood assemblies in most uh, Greek towns and cities where people are coming together, squares or whatever, public places, and having large uh, assemblies where they'll not only discuss the situation politically but they'll and, and, and plan for that, but also uh, help each other out with running some basic kind of amenities that are being um, Take, have already been taken away due to austerity measures that, that
they can't see any hope in actually getting back. Um, there's been, you know, the, a rise of kind of, uh, they're called really, really free markets where people, you know, like kind of people will come and freely trade stuff they don't use or need or whatever out of their shed and, and share it around. And stuff like a rise in farmers just coming straight from the farm with trucks full of potatoes that, you know, they can get a better price from just selling it on the street and bypassing the, uh, the supermarkets and, and the extreme taxation. But there's also been like some pretty worrying things going on, like the rise of Golden Dawn in uh, the fascist party in, uh, was notable in the elections, but um, also actually it's more so their, their extra parliamentary action that is, that's to, to worry about. Um, years ago already they were doing things like locking immigrants out of um, playgrounds and stuff like that if you know an immigrant brought their children to a playground they'd beat them up and say you know don't come back here this is a Greek playground and that's that was that stuff was kind of you know here and there a few years ago but now of course they're quite an organized force there's a lot of support for them amongst police forces they'll often join the riot police in a demonstration against the you know the, the the communists or you know anarchists or whatever to, to fight them they'll be tossing rocks back from the police lines um, and as well they've been doing they've been uh, running some similarly running some like uh, basic amenities in, in neighborhoods and things like that going out and, you know distributing food or you know whatever or clothing or whatever but you know to greet people and making it known that this is a golden dawn um, service or whatever uh, and the media in Greece has been stirring up anti-German, which is tensions from due to where the, the you know the, where they point to the pressure coming from, and but also historically from the German occupation. So they find they found that a, a pretty easy um, sentiment to stir, um, and Golden Dawn capitalised on that, and uh, but also anti-migrant. There's something like a, a million or more or more than a million migrants in Greece, and some estimate of like you know over a hundred thousand arriving per year or something like that, and and the Greek government has always been, whichever one's in power has always been doing things uh, against immigrants. Years ago in Patra, which is a port city, they were demolished a uh, like a shanty town that had uh, been built in one of these squares and kicked everyone out and. That was kind of the end of it. Don't come back here. It scared everyone off. But um, it was on on August the tenth. The the government is, initiated a policy. I don't remember the name of it. But what they've started doing is going to train stations in central cities and lighting the platforms with police. And everyone who gets off that looks foreign, they pull them aside, put them on a bus, take them away to some undisclosed location. Effectively, if Greece chooses to leave the eurozone which I think almost 78% of the public are against. Uh, they are uh, vast <coughs> amounts of capital will flood out of the country and Jack will be hugely devalued, gripping the economy in the short term, basically near uh, third world living conditions. It, it's one of the only options they have because of their union with the EU. They can't do anything like uh, I think Argentina did 10 years ago. So Argentina already had its own currency. Yeah. Greece has. So they, yeah, they can't. It's got a more difficult problem. But it's not an insoluble problem. What do you mean by that? Well, they could uh, close the banks, put on capital controls, and abandon the euro and reintroduce the drug money. Cause quite a bit of chaos in the short term. Yeah. But it's been done before, historically, and it's quite achievable. So it's not going to cause the sky to fall or anything like that. In fact, it would be, I think, a better option for them because then there would be light at the end of the tunnel instead of just more tunnel, which is what they're looking <laughs> at at the moment. Because then they'll have their, they'll regain macroeconomic policy control. At the moment, they don't have any control at all. They're at the mercy of the ECB and the European Commission and the German government, which is out in la-la land somewhere.
So this, the best option for them is to leave. Even though they committed to the European Union, they, they can stay in the European Union if any the Europeans have got any sense, but they must abandon the Euro. The problem is the Euro. The monetary system is not functional without political union and a transfer of fiscal union. And if they can't agree on that, it's going to collapse. And the situation is deteriorating so much now that the, I can't ever see uh, France and Germany, even if they share the rest of the Euro countries, could form a political union. Can you? Can you see France and Germany forming a political union where they have transfers between probably Germany and just various parts of France? as is happening between West and East Germany once you form a federal state. So unless you can recreate the political conditions necessary for a monetary union, the thing's going to collapse. I see no sign that they recognize that yet. They're still playing a kind of game of chicken, hoping that they can force some reforms. But these reforms will not solve this political problem. They're more likely to aggravate it increase resistance to greater European Union. So at least by 2013 we're going to see the first signs of disintegration in the Euro, I think, if not even sooner, because the Greek Prime Minister is currently visiting France and Germany, asking for extensions of time. They may grant him those extensions, but these are not going to solve that fundamental problem. In fact, I don't think it's there is a solution. Not now. There may have been early on, but not now, because everyone's now fully aware that this requires complete political integration within the Eurozone, and there's too much resistance to that. We've actually put it So I'm predicting collapse pretty soon. This issue of looking at what happened in Greece as something specific to Greece isn't really a, a very good line to follow even though the, I mean, the newspapers love to do it, but I don't really think we should do it. We've got to look at it in terms of how the international crisis came to bear on the shoulders of Greece. A general strike, you've got an integrated European economy. A general strike would really need to happen across national borders and boundaries to be able to actually affect uh, real direct pressure on decisions on a European level, which are the way that it is influencing Greece because Greece isn't really a powerful enough country to resist the uh, European Central Banks. But we're not going to find a resolution to essentially these problems until we essentially find a new model to... Um, we don't need a new model. We, have, we have the model already. We know, some people know what it is, but they're in the minority. <laughs> Keynes presented a general theory which is applicable. He solved all of these problems nearly 80 years ago. But nobody pays any attention to what model is that? The general theory of employment, interest and money. It's a theory of a monetary economy, monetary systems, how they work. The ideas that he put forward there were implemented at the end of the Second World War. The Bank of England was nationalised, the Bank de France was nationalised, and instructed to act in the public interest, given a charter about maintaining high employment and price stability. Aren't those models based on perpetual growth, perpetual population growth, yes, perpetual yes, consumption? Yes. Well, well, that doesn't have a resource-based well, economy up to a point, you, uh, in the formula. Then, you can't, it? well, you can grow perpetually in a kind of a steady state. At the moment, though, the world though, is nowhere it? near such a state. Isn't, isn't that an oxymoron? No. Oxymoron. Growing so. at a steady, well, sustainable rate? No, because... Uh, we can also extract resources from off the planet, which people don't seem to have realized yet. But that's the future. It's likely to happen. And all I can tell you is that area is in a diabolical state. It's poor theory, taught at top-level universities, and these people graduate and go off to work for the IMF, the World Bank, and a whole lot of other yeah. institutions. So the vast majority of people who are working there will be bad, badly educated, don't understand capitalism, let alone anything else. <laughs> and they have the strange model view of the world which doesn't uh, relate to reality. The IMF has been a serial offender in making these mistakes and it has come under serious criticism from within by people like Joseph Stiglitz and another guy, Carl Michael Russo, who 
wrote a scathing critique of the IMF. And to their credit, they moved a little bit, but not very much. They should not be involved in this Euro debacle, because they have no role, useful role to play. It's already having a negative effect on the global economy, it's because you've got three major zones, China, Asia, China, Japan, Asia, um, Europe, America, North and South. Australia doesn't count as a tiny little core conference if it goes and bounces up and down. <laughs> um, and yet all three of those are interlinked and they're all subsiding. They're all struggling. Americans struggling to recover. Europe is doing its best to blow itself up. And the Chinese have used this model of export-led growth to these two other parts of the globe that are not growing. So they have to slow as well. And that feeds back on us. And and it should be interesting for, for a group like Left Unity, the, the rise of, of uh, Syriza, Syriza the, yeah. the, the coalition of the left, as a, as a vehicle to alt uh, articulate uh, the different, uh, the, uh, an alternative model. And, and, and the way that the, that sort of uh, come about has been very interesting. And, uh, and I think it's, um, yeah, it would, would be interesting to hear people's thoughts ar ar around that because like, are people sort of thinking it through and, and like, uh, it would be interesting that people sort of like, like ideas as to, you know, how, what lessons we can draw from, from that experience of sort of the, yeah, a coalition of the radical left and, and the way that that sort of ties into to concrete sort of struggles and then becoming a political expression of that. I think that Greek party, I've listened to a couple of their economists and they seem pretty sensible and understood the nature of the problem. But what is inhibiting the Greeks from taking any action is this confusion between the Euro and the EU. They all want to be committed to remaining in the EU but they threatened with expulsion from the EU if they abandon the Euro, which I don't think is a sensible threat to make by anybody, but it's there and that is kind of a blackmail in a way of trying to keep them in. What we're seeing in Syriza is a really interesting coalition of left forces that are actually offering different alternatives, ones that aren't the same old song and dance of the old um, two parties. And I think that's marked by their extraordinary uh, political and electoral rise. They got like 8% in the last federal election, but then the recent one that they had, the, uh, they got like 27%. They were just off um, beating uh, New Democracy as the um, largest party. They were very close. Um, and this shows the huge change in the political landscape of Greece. Um, so that's got a lot of like, even though they try and implement um, new democracy and PASOP, try and implement new austerity measures and stuff, I'm going to, I'm struggling to see how effective they will be when there is going to be not just general strikes and the economic sort of stuff that Gail's been talking about, but actual economic and political fight back from a huge segment of Greek society. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to see how they try and implement these things when there's going to be such a fight back from the community. Economic growth and material growth don't have to be the same, don't have to sort of be the same thing. Um, simply we live in a society where some of the most valuable uh, products are actually ideas. These are, you know, these don't actually consume more <coughs> physical resources. Um, it's quite possible to have economic growth with, um, w without consuming more resources. It requires a lot more uh, regulation planning, yeah, but, they're not, the, but that, they're not the same thing. It's a, and it, it basically, you just go back to Marx, it's quite simple, the, uh, the vast majority, yeah, and of course other people, but um, it, it's quite simple, the vast majority of, of use values are use values of the imagination. Once you get past uh, food, shelter, um, you know, water, you know, that, that sort of stuff, basically everything else we only imagine we need. We, we are human beings, we have vast imaginations, and they will grow, and they are unlimited, essentially. So, I mean, Karl Marx thought that the uh, use values uh, were an unlimited um, uh, thing that we could, we could deal with. Secondly, one of the other things is that what we're talking about unlimited generation of things is just what the uh, US Federal Reserve is doing in creating, you know, sort of uh, money for, its, um, uh, for, for banks. It's giving free money, interest-free loans, you know, which you don't have to repay, because essentially it's not much different from a gift. In many transaction systems and in many legal systems, it's treated as a gift. If you give money, 
it, um, if you make it as a, a loan, it's taxed as if it's a gift. You know. Um, now the thing about that is that a lot of people talk about it as if it's some kind of paper, uh, you know, it's paper money. They don't print this stuff. Most of this stuff actually exists only electronically. Yeah. It is so notional. And when you see people starving, people hungry, and people, you know, in sort of hospitals going without medication based on these concepts, you realise how, how artificial the whole concept is. It was the focus of the left realignment. One of the other things that's quite interesting here, the growth from you know, around about 5% vote in previous elections for the far left to nearly half of the percentage occurred in a very short time and it was over class issues. The thing is that people respond in the, the revolutionary aspect that Karl Marx analysed about the working class was that its specific material interest was co coincided with a general social interest. And this is actually, this is a very important thing to understand when you're looking at programs and how you can change things. I, I guess one of the points I want to make about Syriza is it's been a long-term, you know, 20-year process. And people have had that decades-long kind of vision to, even though there might have been the kind of crises occurring in the early 90s, late 80s, you know, planting those seeds and setting things up so that in the, in the longer term you can take advantage of the uh, opportunities that, that arise when, when that inevitable crisis occurs and you're going to get that uh, problem with the centre right. Um, that said, I just, and I don't know enough about Syriza and its relationship with the mass movement, but I know that certainly Communist Party in Australia and other groups and uh, criticise Syriza for, I guess, emphasising the parliamentarist process and Greece is certainly out of history of military takeover and dictatorship and I think it's an important question that if they had one or if there's another election soon, which there could, could well be given the critical nature of the, the state, uh, if Syriza actually got state power and, and attempts to implement some of the more progressive anti-austerity measures, what would be the what would be the reaction of the the establishment forces and, and the state? Um, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to sit by indefinitely and the more the more progressive and I guess the more effective they are, the, the less probability there is of that. This raises the whole question of you know left movements and their relation to parliament and the state and um, I'd be interested in hearing people's comments about how they perceive Syriza's role and, and to what extent are they working in extra parliamentary ways to, to ensure that there, there would be that level of defence against such a response. As on the question of uh, whether the left has an answer for any of this, you know, heard it's about capitalism and it's a crisis. Uh, but what would the left do in this situation? Well, Colin offers Keynesianism. Um, I think it's a crisis of governance, not a crisis of capitalism. Mm. And as a Keynesian, you would think. Um, but I, I guess the, uh, the Keynes, you know, the, 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 the Keynesians the, the are the Marxists in the room. Would, no, we're not really meant to approve of Keynes. No, that's another question. I mean, there seems to be an attitude that, that it would be a good thing if Syriza won the election. It would be a disaster if Syriza won the election. If Syriza won the election, um, they would be thrown out of the Eurozone. Uh, the new drachma would, uh, would massively devalue. There would be hyperinflation. Now, you might be able, before you interrupt me, but, but there might, you might be able to ride this out if you were the Syriza government, but you would only be able to ride it out on the basis of keeping wages down, on the basis of austerity policies, on the basis of an authoritarian system. It would be North Korea in South Southern Europe. Now, I realise there are some people who think it would be an absolutely splendid outcome, but, um, <laughs> but I think it would be a disaster for the left and a disaster for the Greek people. So where do you go from there? I mean, it seems to me... That, I mean, the real, the real thing here is, surely, this problem can't be solved in Greece. 
And that's not the usual like-minded call to world revolution. But the fact is that Syriza would be mad to take political power in Greece because they would end up administering the austerity policies. Syriza should stay as far away from political... They should refuse to take political power and remain a, a, a consistent uh, militant opposition to austerity policies until... The, the class consciousness of the Greek working class is at a point where it would accept a Marxist program. And at that point, we would expect that working classes elsewhere might be at that point as well. But that's the solution, <coughs> not taking power. Why is the rapid rise of Serzia? Because is it because there's a rapid rise of, of people's struggles and people see where the major parties stand and they see that, you know, like going on strikes and things, they need to be looking to these alternatives. And I think, like, for me, like, if Serzia or, or, or the left in, in Greece won the government, it would be an enormously difficult task and it would be dependent for it to succeed in any way. Like, it would be dependent on people mobilising and stuff and probably having to think outside the box and to experiment with. Um, you know, or find ways to make the sort of the short the, the hospital occupation something that, that, that is something that can be a sustainable sort of thing. You, you would need that for for it to, to be meaningful. But like, yeah, like I, I, for me, I, I, like I don't, um, yeah, like we, we yeah, you, you, you can't. Like I think that would actually break people's trust. And and I, well, and that experience of like having the left a left win and then like to be putting forward programs that would be alternative like would lead people through the pr a process of struggle which would help develop their consciousness so i think like people's consciousness doesn't develop purely from from ideas and from reading like a, a few of us in a room might but like fundamentally as a society we need to like take these as things that we know to be uh what we believe to be true and experiment them in a, in, a, in a broader scale and that sort of thing and i think like yeah if you go into like in terms of state and that sort of stuff like we would need to be going in, or, or the sozio and, and you know maybe one day left unity but like yeah they're taking these sort of struggles and say you know like to to expose the limitations of of a government in a sense without you know drawing out broader things so that's that's my um, understanding of things and and why i'd be very excited about you know potential future electoral sort of stuff and the potential of struggles around that in terms of raising people's consciousness further what i see is a is a is a global system that's broken people seem to be demonstrating because they know something's wrong banking systems failing capitalism seems to be failing um, governance seems to be failing, but we don't have um, any real resolutions. You mentioned a, a new system that might work, but it seems to be based on resources from another planet. Um, I hear here, this guy mentions that our economic model um, should have um, in intellectual um, assets as part of the formula, but I don't see any government actually talking about in intellectual property in our economic formula, I only hear population growth, material consumption, and that seems to be part of what is broken. So I'd love to hear more conversation about resolutions. Resolutions will come when people are realizing that um, um, that the system doesn't actually work for the majority, and that they will, that, that as that increases in Western countries, at least anyway, um, where people have you know, some capacity to organize against it, then you will see solutions come from the struggle, which is why I bring up the hospital. So I, I bring that up because I see that not only is this somewhere where people are struggling, where people are fighting and making a stand, but their stand is also what I see as a solution, which is a, a collectivized method of a democratic method of running industry which when taken from just the one hospital to the pharmaceutical factory to you know the place that makes the chemicals for the pharmaceutical endpoint and you have what I would see as a viable solution but only through struggle is that possible to be realized you know so that's yeah